this episode brought to you by thegiveawaygeek.com. Win board games, electronics, and gift cards at thegiveawaygeek.com. The geek that keeps on giving. Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you a how to play video for Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition is a game designed by Nikki Valens based on the first edition design by Corey Konitska and published by Fantasy Flight Games. It is a game of investigation and horror inspired by the writings of H.P. Lovecraft. During the game, one to five investigators will work together to explore a location and unravel a mystery. They'll have to cooperate in order to overcome the challenges, obstacles, and monsters that the game will throw at them through the fully integrated companion app. Players will need to download the free companion app found at most digital online app stores. So now let's take a look at how to play Mansions of Madness. Enter the app and from the main menu, if this is your first time playing, select more. Then select my collection. From here, you can select which first edition products you already own. Also, in the future, you will be able to let the app know when you purchase additional 2nd Edition products. Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition will be already selected by default. Be sure to separate out any items from the conversion kit that you do have from the 1st Edition of Mansions of Madness, and then take all the ones from any portion of the 1st Edition that you don't have and place them back in the box. They will not be used unless at some point you purchase that particular item from 1st Edition. Here, I have all the items from Call of the Wild. I'll put them back in the box. Separate the investigator cards from all the other cards. These will be used a little bit later during the setup. Separate the rest of the cards into decks by card type. Here you can see I have damage and hard decks, common and unique items. These decks are all the condition decks. And here I have all the spell decks. These three spells being non-combat, and these three spells being combat spells. Shuffle the damage and horror decks individually and place them within reach of all the players. Common and unique item decks should be organized alphabetically so that you can easily find the card you're looking for when prompted to by the app. Also, for the purpose of telling them apart, common items will have this back and unique items have this back. Also, some items are double-sided such as the whiskey common item and the handcuffs unique item. They have text on both sides of the card. You can always be sure to know which is a unique item and which is a common item by the slightly greenish background on the unique items and the golden key that you'll see on either side versus the brownish background for the common item. Each spell deck should be shuffled as well and placed within easy reach of all the players. Out of the six condition decks, only the insane deck needs to be shuffled. And then the conditions should also be placed within reach of the players. Gather all map tiles and organize them by tile size. Also, take note that all the tiles from the second edition have this tentacle mark next to the name. On the other hand, the first edition tiles do not have anything next to the name. Make sure that each monster has a matching token slotted into its base so that the numbers show up in the openings. Separate all tokens into pools by token type. Place these tokens within easy reach of the players as well. And of course, don't forget your dice. The dice are eight sided with three success symbols, two investigation symbols, and three blank sides. Next, you'll need to choose your scenario. From the app main menu, press new game. Decide as a group which scenario to play, noting the estimated time and difficulty of each scenario. 
The difficulty and duration can vary quite a bit from scenario to scenario. Notice here you have two out of five difficulty, 60 to 90 minutes for Cycle of Eternity. Escape from Innsmouth has four out of five difficulty, 90 to 150 minutes. Shattered Bonds, five out of five difficulty, 120 to 180 minutes for duration. And Rising Tide, three out of five difficulty, 240 to 360 minutes. For these purposes, we'll select Cycle of Eternity. Each player chooses an investigator, taking that investigator card and figure for that investigator. Here you can see I've chosen Rita Young from the second edition and Harvey Walters from the first edition. Unused investigator cards are returned to the box. Also, if playing the game solo, that player should choose two investigators to control at least. Since we're deciding which investigators we're going to use, let's take a closer look at the investigator cards and exactly what they mean. Each investigator has six skills that represent their strengths, weaknesses, and talents. Strength represents the investigator's physical prowess and endurance. Strength is well suited for making attacks with heavy weapons and helps avoid suffering damage from physical trauma. Agility represents physical speed and coordination. High agility is well suited for making attacks with a bladed weapon or firearm and assists in evading monsters. Observation represents an investigator's attention to detail and spatial awareness. High observation helps in searching for information and picking locks. Lore represents an investigator's academic and arcane knowledge. High lore will assist in casting spells and collating large amounts of information. Influence represents charisma and social acumen. High influence is well suited for interacting with people. Will represents discipline and moxie. An investigator with high will is less likely to suffer harm from mental and social trauma. A skill's value indicates how many dice the investigator will roll when testing that skill. So if Rita Young is gonna test her observation, she would roll three dice. Each investigator also has a health and sanity rating. Many game effects cause investigators to suffer damage or horror. When this happens, the investigator draws the top card of the appropriate deck face up unless an effect specifically says to draw it face down. Each damage or horror card will specify whether to resolve it immediately or keep it face up. In this case, she drew minor injury only a flesh wound, resolve immediately, no additional effect, flip this card face down. And so she'll put the card next to her investigator card face down. On the other hand, broken leg, you fall as pain lances up your leg. When you try to stand, you fall all over again. Keep face up. If you move more than a single space as part of a move action, flip one damage face up. So that one will stay face up next to her investigator card. Always follow the instructions on the card, but generally speaking, a card that says resolve immediately will have an immediate effect and end up being flipped face down. On the other hand, a card that says keep face up will have a lasting effect for as long as that card remains face up. When an investigator has suffered total damage equal to her health, she becomes wounded. Here you can see Rita has seven face down damage and two face up damage equaling her nine health. When an investigator becomes wounded, they will discard all of their face down damage, shuffling it back into the damage deck and keeping their face up damage. And then they'll gain the wounded condition, which states you cannot perform the move action more than once each round. If a wounded investigator suffers total damage equal to her health again, she will be eliminated from the game. Similarly, when an investigator suffers horror equal to her sanity, she becomes insane. She discards all of her face down horror cards, shuffling them back into the horror deck and keeping any face up horror and gains an insane condition. The investigator who just became insane reads the back of this insane condition, but does not share it with any other investigator. In this case, 
Spread the truth. No one believes you, but you have seen it. The truth is out there. You do not win the game as normal. Instead, you win only if the investigation is complete and you have two or more evidence unique items. Otherwise, lose the game. And down here, you can see this card is used in any game with one or more players. So in other words, this card is used in all the games you'll ever play. However, in this case, this one's only used in games with two or more players. And keep in mind, this is the number of players, not the number of investigators. So regardless of how many investigators each player is using, you only count the players when determining whether or not one of these insane conditions will be used in that game. When a player draws an insane condition, they must check this number. And if the number of players who started the game is less than the number of required players for that condition, she must discard it and draw a new one. When an insane investigator suffers horror equal to her sanity again, she is eliminated from the game. If an investigator is eliminated, whether by taking too much horror or too much damage, she drops all of her possessions and her space and removes her investigator from the board. Once an investigator is eliminated from the game, the rest of the investigators have until the end of the following investigator phase to complete the main objective. If they do not complete the main objective by the end of that phase, they must select the investigator eliminated option from the main menu. After you've selected your investigators, you'll need to select them in the app as well. So we have Rita Young and Harvey Walters. Then press Gain Starting Items. At this point, the app will instruct investigators to gain, as a group, specific common items, spells, clue tokens, or other possessions, possibly even unique items. In this case, you can see we've been given the brass knuckles, holy cross, kerosene lantern, medical textbook, and the spell, feed the mind, as well as two clue tokens for each investigator. These items can be split amongst the investigators in whatever way they decide, while the clue tokens must be distributed as indicated by the app. Next, the app will narrate to you the prologue, which we've skipped for the purposes of this video. However, players should pay close attention during the prologue as there may be important clues within the story. Next, you'll need to place the starting map tile or tiles as indicated. Here you can see we place the lobby and walls. This right here is a door, however, on the app, it shows a wall there. So we'll take one of the rectangular wall tiles and cover that door. And actually, I missed placing that wall as well. The app will continue to give you some story and show you where to place your figures. You'll also need to place search tokens, explore tokens, and any other tokens as instructed. When the setup is complete, the app will automatically progress to the first round's investigator phase. Mansions of Madness is played over a series of rounds. Each round consists of two phases, with the investigators going first in the investigators phase, followed by the game taking control of all the horrific happenings in the mythos phase. Let's take a closer look at exactly what a tile consists of. Every map tile will have at least one room in it, Every room has at least one space in it, but many have more than one. In this case, the dining room has two spaces, as does the kitchen. Spaces are separated from other spaces by borders, impassable borders, walls, or doors. In this case, this space is separated from this one by this white border, and this space is separated from this space by this yellow border. Anytime you see a white or yellow solid line, that is a border. 
Borders divide large areas into multiple spaces. Investigators and monsters can move through borders. Impassable borders, on the other hand, are represented by dashed wider yellow lines, like this dashed yellow line here. Investigators or monsters cannot move through impassable borders. Walls are represented by brown lines, such as the ones all the way around this tile and these in the middle of the tile. Investigators and monsters, as you may have guessed, cannot move through walls. Doors are represented by a rectangular gap in the wall, such as here and here. Investigators and monsters can move through doors. Monsters represent both eldritch creatures and the worshippers of those creatures. Here, we've got a child of Dagon and a deep one. Each monster has a corresponding token which slips into the base of that monster, and on that token are several key pieces of information. The green number in the top right corner of the token is the monster's awareness. This number is referenced when an investigator resolves an evade check when multiple monsters are in her space. The blue number in the bottom right corner is the monster's horror rating and represents how horrific a monster is. This number is referenced when an investigator must complete a horror check and multiple monsters are within range. The number on the bottom of the token is the monster's brawn. Brawn is referenced by various effects to include when a monster attempts to break through a barricade and when an investigator attempts to push a monster. Finally, the bottom of the token also has flavor text and in some cases, such as with this monster, has a special ability. In this case, the deep one is aquatic, which means this monster can move through impassable borders that represent water. Common and unique items represent the various objects that investigators will come into contact with through the course of their investigation. Investigators can tell which items are common items by this card back and unique items by this card back. Also, they can tell by looking at the front because common items are more brown and have this sort of border, whereas the unique items are more greenish and have this sort of border with the gold key and this other item down here. For double-sided items, investigators may read the back of the card anytime they wish to see what the effect is on the back. However, when a double-sided card is initially claimed, the investigator always claims it art side up. Some items are weapons. If an item is a weapon, there are two key things you'll need to pay attention to. The type of weapon, heavy weapon, bloody weapon, or firearm, and the weapon's base damage represented in this blood splatter number here. Spells represent the tomes or scrolls containing the knowledge required to harness eldritch power. When an investigator gains a spell, she claims one random copy of that particular spell art side up. An investigator may not look at the back of the spell until an effect causes the spell to flip. For instance, with this spell, as an action, you or another investigator within range discard one damage, then flip this card. That will be the most common time a spell will flip is when an investigator casts the spell. And you can see in this case, after resolving the action on the front, you have this additional effect to deal with. Most spells will have you discard the spell and gain a new random one. When doing so, take the one you cast, shuffle it back into the deck of the same cards, and draw another one without looking at the back. During the investigator phase, each investigator may take up to two actions during their turn. Investigators may choose to do this in any order and can change the order from round to round. Once an investigator begins taking their actions, however, they must complete all their actions before the next investigator takes their turn. Once all of the investigators have taken their turns, the investigator phase ends and the mythos phase will begin. Investigators may take the following commonly used actions. Move, attack, search, explore, interact, and trade. Also, many components such as items or spells will have additional actions described on them that investigators can take. Out of all these actions, explore, search, and interact, and sometimes the component actions, will require the investigators to interact with the app to take those actions. An investigator during their turn may tap any of the icons presented 
on the app and see what the initial description is of that icon. Doing so does not require an action and doing so does not require the investigator to be in the same space as that icon. Keep in mind that anything that you have to do in the app that will require an action will be preceded by an action icon arrow. First, let's discuss the move action. When an investigator chooses this action, she may move her figure up to two spaces moving into one adjacent space at a time. Two spaces are considered adjacent if they share a border, a door, an impassable border, or a wall with another space. However, remember that walls and impassable borders block movement, so an investigator could not move like this unless some other effect allowed it. Also, a door is not considered to be in either space. It is instead adjacent to the two spaces it connects. An investigator is allowed to interrupt their move to perform another action such as investigating this token and then continue their movement afterwards. Now let's discuss the explore action. An investigator may explore adjacent rooms that have the explore token leading to them. To do so, the investigator must occupy the same space as that token or a space adjacent to the door the token is placed on. So for instance, right here, this token is placed on this door. The door is not actually in the space, but adjacent to the space. So an investigator in this space could explore this token. Alternatively, if this token had been placed, say, on this wall, it would be considered in the space the investigator is in, at which point the investigator could also explore that token. Once an investigator decides to explore an explore token, she will select the explore token on the app. The app will tell you what you know about the area you're about to explore and then give you one or multiple options. In this case, the only option is to explore. Keep in mind, anytime you see one or more options available, if it has that arrow, it is considered an action to select that option. The investigator will select the option she wants and then follow the instructions provided by the app. In this case, it says to discard this explore token, place the office tile as indicated, and to place this wall to cover that door. And then you will continue placing items or people as the app tells you. And finally, the app will often give you the option to move one space into the explored area. If you do so, that does not count towards one of your move actions. Next, let's talk about the search action. The investigator uses the search action to search something of interest in her space. Let's say Rita Young wants to search this item right here. To do so, the investigator selects the search token in the app then confirms search with the app, and then follows any effect the app provides. In this case, the investigator simply gains one clue token. However, often searching will result in skill checks, which we'll talk about later. An investigator who uses the trade action may give any number of common or unique items or spells to each other investigator in her space. So these two investigators could trade as many items amongst themselves using only a single trade action. Additionally, an investigator can use the trade action to pick up or drop any number of items in a space. The interact action allows the investigator to use the app to interact with a person or object in their space. The investigator simply selects a person or interact a token in her space and then confirms the action by selecting the appropriate option. Remember, anytime you see the action arrow, that option will cost an action. The investigator will then resolve any effect as instructed by the app, which may include additional decisions as well as skill tests. Some components or effects allow investigators to perform actions. These actions are described by the component or effect that allows the investigator to perform the action. For instance, the common item 2x4 allows the investigator to, as an action, brace the door with the board. Flip this card and place it against a door in your space. Which means that at this point you'll treat this card as a barricade that blocks the door it is placed against. All component actions are preceded by the word action in bold and can be performed only by the investigator who holds the card. 
Some components, as I've discussed before, will require the app to perform an action. To do this, investigators will open the inventory by clicking on the inventory button at the bottom left of the screen, which looks like a little bag. The investigator can then select that item, and the item will describe how it can be used and by who. Any possible actions will appear on screen preceded by the action icon. After an investigator selects that action, they must perform any effect and resolve any effect that occurs as a result of that. Only the items requiring the app will appear in the inventory, so keep that in mind. You won't see most of the items that you have when you click on the inventory button. If an investigator wishes to attack a monster, she must first determine which monster she wishes to attack and if she will use a melee, ranged weapon, or hand-to-hand. -hand. Remember that a ranged weapon will be indicated Remember that a ranged weapon or spell will be indicated by the firearm in the lower left corner of the artwork. And a melee weapon is indicated with the knife. If the investigator is using a melee weapon, she must be in the same space as the monster. However, if she is using a ranged weapon, the investigator may attack any monster up to three spaces away. All ranged items have a range of three spaces. Keep in mind that range cannot be counted through walls or doors. However, technically there is no line of sight in this game, so one, two, three spaces away, this monster is within range of a ranged weapon. However, the investigator does not have range on the monster here because range cannot be counted through a door. Once the investigator decides what weapon she's going to use to attack, the investigator will open the monster drawer with the center icon here, select the monster she wishes to attack, press the attack button, and then select what manner of attack she's going to make, in this case, unarmed. The app will then most likely provide the investigator with a test that she needs to roll against. In this case, an agility test, and she needs two successes. We'll discuss skill tests a little bit more in a moment. However, you can see that if the investigator passed the skill test, there's one effect, and if the investigator failed the skill test, there's a different effect. It's important to note that when an investigator is in the same space as a monster, as Rita Young is here, if she attempts any action other than an attack action, or if she tries to move out of the space as part of her move action, she must perform an evade check. If there are multiple monsters in the investigator space, she must only evade the one with the highest awareness. The hunting horror has an awareness of five, while the deep one has an awareness of three, so the evade check would only occur against the hunting horror. To perform the evade check, the investigator must select the monster from the monster drawer that she wishes to evade and select the evade option and then confirm it. The investigator then resolves the effect as instructed. After evading a monster, the investigator performs her action as normal unless the app says the action is forfeit. If the action is forfeit, the investigator may not resolve any portion of the action's effect. If the investigator was moving, she loses the rest of her movement. Occasionally, multiple monsters of the same type will be present on the game board. If that's the case, the game will indicate a particular symbol to be placed on that monster's base to keep it straight from the other monsters of the same type. In addition to the previously discussed commonly used actions, there are several rarely used actions that the investigator is likely to use only in very specific circumstances. The push action can be used to push monsters or other investigators. First, the investigator must choose an investigator or monster in her space to push, and then selects an adjacent space to push them into. Let's say Rita Young wants to push Harvey Walters into this space. In this case, the target is an investigator, and the investigator may choose to move willingly or to resist the push. If the target investigator resists, then the target investigator must test her strength. The number of successes rolled plus one will equal the test difficulty for the investigator attempting the push action. So in this case, Harvey Walters has strength of three, and he got one success. So the successes plus one equals two, 
and two will be the test difficulty for Rita Young. The active investigator must now test her strength. If the test result equals or exceeds the test difficulty, the target is pushed into the space previously chosen by the active investigator. So, as we said before, the test difficulty is a two, and Rita Young has a strength of five, so she'll roll all five dice, and she got a two, and since her result is equal to or greater than the test difficulty, she succeeds. Harvey Walters will be pushed into that space. After successfully pushing an investigator into another space, then the active investigator may move the, to the chosen space as well. Now let's back up for a moment and say the target investigator did not resist and instead moved willingly. In that case, the target investigator would simply move to the chosen adjacent space and then the active investigator could choose to do the same. Let's back up one more time and say the target was instead a monster. Monsters will always resist the movement and the test difficulty is equal to their brawn. So in this case, the active investigator would have to roll a number of successes equal to or higher than two, which is the child of Dagon's brawn. Other than that, the push action is resolved exactly the same way. If successful, the monster will move to the chosen space and the investigator may do so as well. If, whether with an investigator or a monster as the target, the push action fails, then the active investigator forfeits the rest of her action. Another rarely used action is the steal action. This action allows investigators to forcibly take items from other investigators. First, the active investigator must choose an investigator in her space to target. Let's say Harvey Walters is going to try to steal something from Rita Young. The active investigator then chooses either strength, agility, or observation as the test, and then both investigators will test the chosen skill. So looking at their skills, Harvey Walters isn't going to want to put his strength up against Reedy Young's. He certainly isn't going to put his agility up against Reedy Young's either. So observation is the only one he outranks her on, and he's going to try that one. For every success, the active investigator rolls in excess of the target investigator, the active investigator may take one item from the target. So Harvey Walters rolls three successes. Rita Young rolls three successes as well. So Harvey Walters actually gets nothing from her. And the investigator using Harvey Walters must forfeit the rest of her action. Keep in mind, that only common items, unique items, and spells are possessions, and all other types of components are not possessions, meaning that only the common items, unique items, and spells can be stolen. The set fire action requires the investigator to have a light source in their possession, such as the oil lamp unique item. You can see here it says light source. As an action, an investigator may place a fire token in an adjacent space or her own space. A fire token may never be placed in a space that already has a fire token. If there are no other fire tokens on the board when you place your fire token, you must go into the main menu and choose the set fire option and confirm it. By selecting the set fire option, the game will now know to prompt investigators to spread fire at the beginning of each mythos phase. When prompted to spread the fire, the investigators will select a single space adjacent to one fire token on the board and place a fire token in that space. For instance, this space or this space. Keep in mind that fire only spreads one space per turn. So in this case, you would choose only one adjacent space, which means you have the option of spreading the fire here, 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 or here but only one of those spaces will have the fire spread to it. Fire is harmful to both investigators and monsters. If an investigator moves into a space containing fire, she suffers one face down damage. If an investigator is in a space with a fire and performs any action other than the move action, she suffers one face down damage. If an investigator in a space with fire attempts a move action, but ends up forfeiting her action for any reason, such as failing an evade check from a monster, she will suffer one face down damage. If a monster starts its activation in a space containing fire or moves into a space containing fire, it suffers one damage. 
An investigator may spend one action to attempt to extinguish fire by testing her agility. For each success rolled, she may discard a fire token from her space or any space she moves into later during the round. So in this case, Rita Young can extinguish one fire token. Fire discarded by the extinguish fire effect does not cause the investigator to suffer damage. This is the only action other than a move action that an investigator could take while in a space with fire and not take damage. The last action available to investigators is to use a barricade to block a door. As an action, an investigator may move a barricade in her space against a door or secret passage in the same space, like this. Barricades may not be moved to another space. Investigators may not move through doors or secret passages blocked by a barricade. An investigator on the opposite side of a door or secret passage blocked by a barricade may attempt to move the barricade out of the way. To do so, the investigator will test her strength. If she rolls two or more successes, the barricade moves away from the door or secret passage and the investigator may move one space into the room that was blocked. So in this case, Rita Young moves the barricade away from the door and comes through the door. A monster may also attempt to move through a barricaded door or secret passage. First, you'll have to determine the number of dice the monster will roll. Start with the printed value of the monster's brawn, in this case, two. Then add or subtract all dice specified by other effects such as monster abilities. In this case, it will just be the two brawn. Next, roll the dice, and if the monster rolls two or more successes, he's made it through the barricade. In this case, only one success, so he didn't make it. However, if the monster rolled two successes, the barricade is completely destroyed and removed from the board. At this point, the monster would continue his movement as normal. If the monster does fail to destroy the barricade, its movement is forfeit at that point. Also note that players may not use any sort of special ability or any sort of effect to reroll or convert dice results from the monster's roll. After all players have performed up to two actions, one player will select the round end button in the bottom right corner of the screen and confirm in the investigator phase, at which point the mythos phase will begin. During the mythos phase, the app will generate various types of effects that the investigator is going to have to deal with. There are three types of effects that the investigators may encounter. And investigators will sometimes encounter all of these effects and sometimes only some of these effects. The three types of events that investigators may encounter are mythos events, monster activation, and horror checks. The app will generate one or more Mythos events to be resolved by investigators during the Mythos events step of the Mythos phase. Each event will clearly state its effect and how to resolve it. For instance, right here we have suddenly the temperature drops and your breath mists in the air. No immediate effect. So this Mythos event does not have any effect on investigators. However, more often than not, a Mythos event will involve some sort of skill check and result in horror or damage being taken by the investigator. As you can see there, when I press continue, the investigator phase immediately began. This is because there are no monsters currently on the board, as you can see there. Anytime there are no monsters on the board, the app will automatically begin the investigator phase after the mythos event occurs. However, if there are monsters present, the app will generate instructions for activating the monster during the monster activation step of the mythos phase. On occasion, monsters will also spawn during this step of the mythos phase. These instructions will explain how to move each monster as well as how and who each monster will attack. For instance, in this case, the app shows us that the crawling one will move one space toward the nearest investigator within range. Then it attacks the investigator in its space with the lowest strength. So the first thing you have to think about is how many investigators are within range. Because if none are within range, then you won't move the crawling one and you'll click no investigators within range. Also, once he's moved that one space, then he'll attack if an investigator is in his space, not if an investigator is within range. But if no investigator is in his space, he'll click that option there. If the monster does attack, the app will also give you instructions on how to resolve that. 
usually involving some sort of skill check, in this case, an agility skill check. After all monsters have been activated for the round, the app will move on to the horror check step of the mythos phase. All investigators will be prompted to take a horror check against one monster within range. If an investigator is not within range of any monsters, they do not have to take a horror check. If there are monsters within range of investigators, each investigator within range of a monster will check to see which monster within range is the most horrific by looking at the horror rating. Once an investigator has determined the appropriate monster, she will select that monster from the monster drawer, confirm the horror check, and resolve the effect as indicated. Again, usually involving a skill check. After all investigators have finished resolving their horror checks, one investigator will press the end mythos phase button. This begins the next round. Each scenario has different objectives that will determine what investigators must do to win. However, the investigator's ultimate goal is hidden from them when they begin the game. During the course of the game, the investigators must unravel the mystery and discover just what exactly their ultimate goal is. Investigators should carefully listen to the scenario's prologue and carefully examine each hint they discover. After the investigation has progressed enough, the primary objective will be revealed, giving the investigators their final task to complete. If investigators complete that objective, they win the game. If investigators take too long in their investigation, the scenario's objective may change or become more difficult to accomplish. Eventually, if the investigators take too long, they will simply lose the game. Now that we've talked about most of the rules for playing the game, let's discuss skill tests. A skill test represents a physical, mental, or social challenge the investigator must overcome. A skill test is declared using its skill icon embedded in parentheses following a short narrative, as you find here with the agility skill. When an investigator is resolving an effect that includes a skill icon, she must immediately test that skill. To resolve the skill test, the investigator must roll a number of dice equal to her value in the indicated skill and the number of successes rolled is the test result. In this case, we're testing agility, and you can see that Harvey Walters has two agility, so he'll roll two dice. The test declaration might also include a plus or minus modifier, again, as you see here, which causes the investigator to roll more or fewer dice. In this case, one additional die. During any skill test, after rolling dice, the investigator may spend clue tokens to convert any investigation results to success results. So here, I'll spend two clue tokens to change both of these investigation results to successes. Sometimes effects will cause an investigator to suffer multiple damage and or horror at the same time, but allow her to negate some or all of it. To do so, the investigator will test the indicated skill and prevent one damage or horror for each success roll. So in the case of this evade check, you can see the investigator is going to suffer two face down damage. Agility negates. I rolled no successes, so the investigator will take two face down damage. If I had rolled one success, the investigator would take one face down damage, and two successes would have completely negated the effect. Some skill tests require the investigator to input the number of successes into the app. The investigator will do so by pressing the plus or minus button like this. In these tests, the number of successes required to pass the test is unknown. However, even if the investigator fails the test, the app will remember how many successes were previously rolled, so future attempts to pass the test will require fewer successes. Some skill test declarations include a test difficulty embedded in the parentheses separated from the skill icon with a semicolon, as you see a one test difficulty here. This is the number of successes that must be rolled in order to pass the test. If the investigator rolls less successes than the required number, she fails. So again, we're testing agility and Harvey Walters has an agility of two and he again fails the agility test and will take the if you fail effect from the evade check. Barricades, fire, darkness, and secret passages are all considered features. We've already discussed barricades and fire, so now let's talk about darkness. 
Darkness hinders an investigator's ability to conduct the investigation. Any investigator in a space containing a darkness token may not use clue tokens to convert dice results or perform additional puzzle steps. Each investigator in or adjacent to a space containing a light source or a fire ignores darkness. For instance, if this oil lamp were simply in this space, not possessed by an investigator, the darkness would have no effect on investigators. Also, if the oil lamp was here in an adjacent space, the darkness would have no effect. Also, if Harvey Walters actually possessed the oil lamp, the darkness would have no effect if he was in this space or an adjacent space. Keep in mind that fire is also considered a light source, and if it is in an adjacent space with darkness or in a space with darkness, the darkness no longer has any effect on investigators. Keep in mind that a darkness token may never be placed in a space with another darkness token. Secret passages connect spaces as if they were adjacent. An investigator or monster in a space containing a secret passage, for instance, this secret passage or this secret passage, may move to any other space containing a secret passage. The last thing we need to talk about are the three types of puzzles an investigator may encounter during the course of an investigation. All puzzles are resolved entirely within the app. Whenever the app instructs an investigator to complete a puzzle, it will also indicate which skill the investigator is going to use to complete that puzzle. The investigator's skill rating for that skill determines how many steps the investigator may take to solve the puzzle per action. While attempting a puzzle, an investigator may spend any number of clue tokens to perform an equal number of additional puzzle steps. After an investigator has performed the maximum number of allowed puzzle steps and doesn't want to spend any more clue tokens to gain more puzzle steps or doesn't have any clue tokens, she presses the close button to close the puzzle out. Her progress will be saved so that she or another investigator may spend another action to pick up where she left off and attempt the puzzle again. When a puzzle is solved, the app will automatically detect it, at which point the investigator will continue resolving her action as instructed. In a slide puzzle, investigators attempt to assemble an image that has been split into six or more pieces. The pieces of a slide puzzle are displayed in a grid and randomized, as you can see here. As a puzzle step, an investigator can swap any two adjacent pieces by dragging one of them over the other. The puzzle is solved when all pieces of the puzzle are in the correct position and the puzzle's image is properly displayed. In a lock puzzle, an investigator attempts to maneuver pieces in a grid to allow the visually unique goal piece to be removed from the grid. In this case, this piece moved to here. As a puzzle step, an investigator can move any piece by dragging it. A piece can be moved only in the direction of its orientation, vertically or horizontally. However, no two pieces can occupy the same space of the grid, and a piece cannot be moved through other pieces. The puzzle is solved when the goal pieces move to the far right of the grid. In a code puzzle, the investigator attempts to determine a code made up of three or more pieces, numbers, or runes. The unique pieces that can make up the code are displayed at the top of the screen, and each piece can be used any number of times. As a puzzle step, an investigator can guess the code. He does so by dragging one piece into each of the current guess brackets and selecting guess. So for instance, after submitting a guess, the investigator will receive information about his guess. The app will mark each incorrect guess with a number of success results and investigation results. Each success result indicates that a single piece of the guess is the correct piece and is correctly positioned within the code. Each investigation result indicates that the guess contains a single correct piece, but that piece is not in the correct position. The puzzle is solved when the investigator guesses the correct code. And finally, let's take a look at the main menu. At the top of the main menu, you can see your current known objective. You can resume the scenario by clicking there. Here you have the message log, which will show all the interactions you've had broken down by round. This is the set fire button we spoke about earlier. Here you can end the game. Here, if an investigator is eliminated, you'll press that button at the end of the next investigation phase. 
and here you can save and quit your game so that you can come back later and finish it. One last thing to note is the condition cards in Manchester Madness. Now, I haven't gone over them in detail, but that's because the condition cards themselves really explain how they function very clearly on the cards. Just remember to discard the condition cards at the time indicated by the card so that you don't end up with a negative condition for longer than you need to. And that's how you play Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. If you have any questions about the rules at all, please leave them in the comments section below and I will be happy to answer them first chance I get. You can find me on Twitter, at Board Offline. I'm also on Board Game Geek. We have a guild over there. Find the link for that in the description below as well. And until next time, if you're bored online, board offline. Yeah.